So welcome to part two of my ESR meter build. Now in part one, I basically gave out a quickie ESR for dummies course, which I gave all sorts of nice little graph on the boffins and how ESR is defined and what how it's measured. Next, I looked how to measure ESR with an oscilloscope. And finally, I reviewed a whole whack of differing ESR meter de designs. Then I chose one, and finally I breadboarded one design and got it to work. So in today's video, I'm actually going to take that breadboard and convert it into a PCB. This video consists of two parts. Part one is me just going over the design and converting it into a schematic and then a PCB board. Part two is me actually creating the PCB board using a product called PCB Fab in a Box. So on to part one. Now I'm not going to do a tutorial on how to use a layout or schematic drawing package, as there are already plenty of those out there on the web. I'm just going to briefly go over what I did for this particular project. Now in the past, I've been largely using Eagle from Autodesk as my layout and schematic program. Now Eagle is rather expensive, but what is nice is the free version has all the features of the paid version, except you're rather limited in what you could create. However, I found lately that it's been very difficult for me to create a very simple uh, PCB layout with this product. So I'm going to try a couple other ones. Now I first decided to use do-it-yourself layout as I've had some bit of luck using it for point-to-point -point and breadboarding layouts. However, I didn't find it any use for making a PCB for me. So I decided to try another popular free product called DipTrace. It is fairly fully featured but not as extensive as you'd find in Eagle. Now it took me about eight hours to get fairly proficient with it, as some of the stuff of course is buried under different menus and whatnot. I started out by just laying down all the basic components from the Wolks ESR meter, of course swapping out the 4049 for my triple nickel. Next I hooked up all the nodes of the circuit diagram, which I found fairly easy to do with dip trace. I'd say the only real problem I had at this stage was trying to get the correct pads and component types in line as they were quite buried in the dip trace library. It's really not as good as Eagle, but still usable. Like any good CAD package, I could easily print out a bill of materials, and I took this build back down to the bench to see what changes I had to make. Well, here is the long and boring part. This is when you take all the stuff you've used and put it away. All the extra little transistors and ICs and resistors and diodes all over the darn place and that block there and it's also the one where you take your BOM, BOM I should say from uh, your schematic you check that to that and write down all the values that you can put back into your schematic at least that's the way I do it the first thing I'll do is I'll take put it as much away as I can and take apart the parts that don't belong to my ESR meter and then when I got that done write down all the parts I have and then go back to the schematic I have and see what I missed on the schematic and then go upstairs fill the schematic in and do that until I'm all done so get ready for some boring stuff as a side note to this I make it a matter of practice now to keep my breadboards together until I finish making the project you never know when you might have to go back and try something new. I've also burnt myself in the past by taking everything apart and not knowing how to put it back together again. Anyway, much later. So I've gone through all my surface mount parts, checked out all the sizes I need to go back on my on the thing. Gotta love surface mount parts. See that? <laughs> and this, and this, and this. A handful of surface mount parts is about the same as those shells over there. <laughs> yeah, well, now you can see why the boffins went to surface mount. Yeah, well, so I got that plotted out. I've got a few changes to make here. I missed a, I missed one capacitor there, and I moved, put that capacitor in the wrong spot. C4 is not supposed to be there. Anyway. I think we're pretty good on this. 
So back to dip trace I go again. This time I added in the switch I forgot to add in the first place. And I also added in one variable resistor that I also forgot. And as I was using a 7805, I figured it was a good idea to try this. So, as a final hookup, and just a final sort of test, I hooked up the uh, LM7805 in there just to see if my little battery over here actually works. And as you can see by the voltmeter, it works fine. It's a little unstable because of the, again, any little tab or touch anywhere screws it up because of inductance but it works fine so I know I'm getting enough power it's getting me 5 volts this isn't getting any warm at all so that means I don't need a heat shield bouncing around moving the table jiggling the table it causes it to bounce should be nice and stable once it's all in place though so the only thing I could do is it's a debate whether or not to leave these little capacitors in here uh, on the LM709, you know, the, it's coming from a battery, but you actually, it actually should be there because you do get some crap coming in and through. So I'm going to leave that like that, but they can just be little ceramics like that. So I'll turn that off for now. So let's put this to the side. Over here somewhere. So comes the fun part of picking a box to put this in. Ugh. I have this nice little plastic one here. The meter kind of fits in there, but it's a little big. So that one doesn't work. That's a lot of box for one meter. <laughs> I want to save that for something else someday anyway. The other meters, I have the other boxes I have are smaller. And there's one really ugly one, but I do have this nice box, which is really nice. wish I had a big meter that would fit there. But I think this is the one I'm going to go with. It's already got holes put all through it. Screws on the back, of course. Holes in there. Holes there. But, I think it should work. Without too much ado. Right. Okay, you know, I could just use the meter in there, but the only problem is, well, not a problem, it's the same scale as this one, in microamp meters. It's just that it's a galvanometer going left and right, and that's actually a useful thing to have around. And I'd only ever have it going in one way, it's so only be using half of it. I looked online to replace this meter, it's about 220 bucks. A new one, they still make them. Yeah. So, I'm gonna take this one off. Seal off of that. Mm. Yeah. So, little thin. So what we can do is get another piece of sheet steel bolt it in like that and bolt it down put a hole in the middle of that and it should fit there. I'm going to clean that up. It should fit in there nicely. I've got uh, three mounting holes which I can remount. So I'm not too worried about that. That'll look that'll nice in there. Give me a nice view. Now the on off switch could put it in top. I might put it just there. Again, it's a small little hole. I don't think it looks good anywhere else. So I'll need a piece of metal to cover that up, or a piece of plastic or something. I'm gonna go out in the shop and get that. Now for dimensions. Where did I put my ruler? Nothing like a cardboard cutout to give you exactly what you want. I think that'll work nicely. And it's just a simple unscrew. The only problem is, if I do that, the meter, this goes into there. So what I'll probably have to do is hook up a jumper so I can disconnect this really easily from that. Otherwise it's going to be a real mess to put back on again. Okay. Yeah, okay, so I'll need a jumper. T point. That would be a jumper. Got 
press button or whatever. So back to Dick Trace once again for some more revisions to my schematic. First I took out the test points and the zero adjust and added in a four point jumper. Next the amp meter and then the switch for another four point jumper to get me this. And then back down to the bench to see if I had a suitable jumper and hookup. So uh, one of the great things you have when you get into this hobby after a while is a junk box. So I was rooting through the junk box and just before I finished reading through my junk box and I decided to go with this one, found this piece right here and I go, well that's not going to help me, it's not connected. But then again, it's two connectors of four, just what I need. All I got to do is cut the wires and I think that's going to give me more than enough wire to go anywhere on the board. So, I'm just going to use this. So back to the schematic software once again. This time I swapped out the jumper here and the jumper here for eight simple pads. As the jumper I chose was just a simple through hole part. Now that I have the schematic mostly worked out, I can move over to start doing the layout. Now Dip Trace has a separate program for this. You can go to it from the schematic and all your parts will be transferred over. You have to very carefully then hook the two of them back up together in case you make any changes in your schematics, but I won't go into the details of that. In this iteration of the layout, I defined the board which I was going to use, and I found that dip trace was, this was much easier to do than eagle. Then I basically just took all the parts of my schematic and placed them on the board trying to put them in some sort of order, but not really caring where they go at this stage, because I still had one more step to do. So one neat little trick I learned eons ago, I actually just got finished putting the layout as you can see, and I put it down there on my, just uh, the uh, preliminary layout. We want to see if I got all the, the boards correct here. Okay, and that was our original size. It's about right. A little smaller, but that doesn't matter. But what you can take is some of this nice foamy stuff. Stick that on there like that. Cut it to size. Or general size. And then what you can do is you can stick in your parts that stick out. Like this one. Which is the LM. Our voltage regulator, stick that one out. Uh, we've got a couple of pots. We've got this guy, which is for our test points. Part of the problem a lot of people have when going from a schematic like this, where it's all spread out, dead bug style, is they want to do the same thing in their layout pattern, on their uh, board layout. And they also think in only one dimension. There's nothing stopping me from putting all the ICs on this, all the passive surface mount components on this side, and then these components on this side. Like this, and a pot. There's two pots. Like this. Right, all my passives over there. A couple of standoffs like that. very easily stick it in like that. And the only problem being I can't really get in there to unscrew those now. So I have to put them in a place where I can get at them and unscrew them. Right? So this side is going to be my... and that actually putting them on the other side tells two problems. One, these aren't surface mount parts so I got to put them through the holes, through the board and then solder them that way. Same thing with these and the other one or two little through hole components I'm using. So that solves that problem by just putting them on the back. So back up into the layout part of Dip Trace, and then I started the rather slow process of selecting pads, values, and moving everything about. And then much, much, much later. So I eventually came up with a fairly nice layout. It really is a rather mundane process of just simply moving things about and then running Dip Trace's auto router. Now, Dip Trace happens to have a very good auto router. Actually, I find it much nicer than Eagle. Here's an example of one running in real time. After running through many, many iterations, I finally got one that had a good layout, my parts in about the right places, 
with only a few little problems to fix. The one problem that took me a long, long time to find and fix was over here on D2 of the schematic. As you can tell from where I circled on the layout, that diode simply just connects the front to the back and doesn't go anywhere. As these diodes are key to my circuit, I really had to correct this problem. I eventually found on the original schematic that I had one extra net that was connecting D2 front to back. Well, I just deleted that. I did another auto route after that and cleaned up the problem. So as a final step, I took advantage of DipTrace's 3D modeling software and ran a quick 3D model. And there I found out another little mistake. I had put one of my pots way too close to my LM7805. So while I was moving those two away from each other, I also took the opportunity to take to move a lot of my components a little further apart so it would be easier to put together. And then I finally came up with this layout. The board was actually much smaller than the original I was working on, so I cut the size of the board as well. So now I can go over to the next side of the process, and that's actually cutting out the the PCB from this. Now not to beat a dead horse, I did take this new much smaller PCB and try to fit it into the bottom of my project box. However, the LM7805 was getting in the way of the panel meter and then I'd also have all these screws sticking on the bottom of my box which I didn't like. So I just kept with my original plan, stick it on the back of the of the project box. So with that all done, let's start part two of this video. Now we come to the actual creating of the PCB. Believe it or not, the creation process took me about one evening, where the actual design and layout took about almost a week. Anyway, I used the PCB lab in a box process. It is a toner transfer method using specialized paper I've always gotten fairly good results. The only caveat with this process is that you cannot use a brother printer. Let me rephrase that one more time. You cannot use a brother printer. And one more time, just to make sure, you cannot use a brother printer. Anyway, not to go too far into the technical reasons, brother laser printer ink is basically incompatible with the toner transfer method. The first step in the process is to create a scaled and mirrored image of your PCB. The only problem I had was that Dip trace only allowed me to use PNG files. I couldn't create a PDF, and I had to use a, let's say, a whole pile of paper to create one that was properly scaled. But once it was properly scaled, it worked. So let's start the process. Okay, so I got all my PCB making stuff all set up on my wet bench, which is actually just my freezer. If everyone go into that, uh, start with a PCB, of course. Over here, got the printer. An HP printer, of course not a brother, computer to print it out and just over here I've got my laminator but I won't turn that on for a while. I've scaled my document to size correctly, I've tested the printer, comes out nice. And what I use for mine is this stuff, PC pad in a box, works really well as long as you don't use a brother printer. Did I say you're not supposed to use a brother printer? Don't use a brother printer. First step in the process is to clean this board off and you just take some normal scratch pad, uh, scotch pad and rub it for about 10 or 15 minutes. When I'm basically finished scouring it, you just uh, circular motion round and 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 round until you get it nice and clean. But before you do anything with it, because you've been mucking with it, you'll see you put fingerprints on it like that. That is really bad for trying to get the uh, the traces to stick to it through a printer. So, before you do that, before you do anything else, after you finish scouring it, you wash with a little oops, rubbing alcohol or ipropoca alcohol first, and then I usually do use a little acetone as well. But be careful with the acetone. Don't get it on any paint because it'll destroy any paint you're using. Then I wash it with alcohol again and wipe it down. But before I do any of that, I go wash my hands because they're filthy. Okay, as well, I'm going to cut out this PC board to about the right size. There's no use using an entire big piece of PCB like this when you're only using I'm making a small one like that. I could actually make about 10 of those of what I'm doing with this thing. But I'll go cut this now as well since I don't mind getting it dirty when I'm cutting it. Okay, that's cut in half. I have a guillotine board I cut. So it does it really quick. Nothing special. There you go. 
nice size. You know, it's a little bit of a waste, but what the heck, I got lots of it. This stuff is cheap. Put that away, and now I'll just wash this thing off. Little paper towel, like that, and pad dry it. Ugh. Now it's important you don't touch it. There you go. Yeah. So you can either pick it up by its side or do what I do. Put on your Mickey Mouse gloves. Yeah. There we go. So now I'm going to let that dry for at least 10 or 50 minutes. And So in the end I actually cut it in half because I found out I have more than enough room to get the whole thing done on one, so I'm going to try that. So, I always start with a nice clean sheet of paper with my PCB on it, and I also mark the orientation, because sometimes this might not be in the center, and if you put it in this way, it'll be offline. So, I'll add the paper on there now. I usually make it a little bigger than I have to. So, let's see. Let's see, that looks nice. Uh, nicely printed down there. Now just take it off and put it on the PCB board. There. Now I can take out these silly gloves since the copper is all hidden under there. Ugh. Okay. I'm going to put this in a little paper packet. Change my desk around for and get the uh, the toner to warm up. Toner, the toner, laminator warmed up so it can do the transfer. So back in about five ten minutes. My laminator is not a particularly good one. One of the gears is stripped in here, so it tends to foobar up a lot. Anyway, just a simple matter of sticking that in there. and running it through about a dozen times. And we'll see what we got on the inside. Anyway, let me get this ready to go put in some water and we'll be all done. So I had the PCB all ready to go in. I'm going to put in a little warm water. Let it float and it should just come right off. Yeah, close. Sometimes you have to poke it a bit. There we go. Came right off. Nothing behind. And there's our nice little PCB. Cool, huh? Got a little spot on it, but we got one more process to do with the laminator and then we can actually start working on it. You gotta love these things. Okay, one of the last steps once it's dried is actually take a look at it with a loop and check for any missing traces. So, after a close examination, I only found one little bad trace over here, which I'll just touch up with the pen. There we go. It's not easy sometimes. So back to the laminator again. This time I'm using the white foil. White foil all it does is it seals the package so it gets rid of all the blotches that happen to be in there. There's a lot of little micropores in there. This stuff seals it. It can also be used for making silk screens but I haven't used it for that. So very simple process as long as you get the damn laminator to work. Fold over like this. Put a little packet. Oop, wrong side around. You want the dull side down and the shiny side up. And just 
carefully stick it in there. You want to make sure you pull it back so it doesn't wrinkle. And you just really need to go through once without burning your fingers. Yep. Take this, and you just pull her off, and you're all nicely sealed. So, almost ready to do the etching. But first, safety gloves, safety glasses, a place I don't need, I don't care about getting dirty since it's already filthy, spill tray, and a Pyrex uh, glass should be Pyrex because that's proof of the thing. And I'm going to get the special chemicals now. And here we go. Ferric chloride. Now it's not that poisonous. It's not carcinogenic. I wouldn't drink it. It'd make you awful freaking sick. It's not something you want to pour out in the backyard. It's actually, if you, uh, what did my wife say? If you uh, put a little extra, uh, a little basic chemical in it, neutralizes the chlorine and it becomes a really good uh, fertilizer for grass but this stuff is probably good this is probably about a 10 year supply maybe I just put it in at room temperature about one half full close that off put it back where it belongs so I don't make accident Cleaned up my board nicely so it's all there. Alright, then you just drop her in. I've got a pokey stick which I can squirrel around with. And a stopwatch. I'll put a top on it so I don't spill any. Normally you start with about three minutes of agitation, then agitate every five minutes after that. So I'll start my watch. And I'll be back when this is all done. Maybe in 35, 40 minutes. It's not particularly warm today. So it's been a good 20 minutes. Let's have a look inside and see what we got. Very carefully open this up. I'm gonna get this crap all over the place. It spills really easy. Poke around in there, see what we have. There we go. Uh, you can tell the copper's beginning to come off on the edges. Well, it's got another half an hour, so it's pretty cold. So got a little while ago yet. Stick out. There we go. Usually you just hold it up to the light, you can see if there's any more copper trace on it, but there. Perfect. Go rinse her off and I'm almost all done. The next to last stage is most fun. You take all this white stuff off just with a simple scotch pad. There we go. Mm -hmm. Yay, how about that? Nice and clean. Now, just wash it with a little alcohol and then little alcohol, and then the final step after this. Okay, for the final part of the process, see how nice and clean I got it. So you're gonna dip it in liquid tin, and that takes about three minutes. Okay, that's been a good 10, 15, well, 5, 10 minutes in there. Dig that out of there. And there it is. Nicely tin. Just need to flush it with warm water. This stuff is nasty. Anyway, what it is I use 
is MG Chemicals liquid tin. That's about a 10 year supply there. <laughs> Very expensive. Okay, as you can guess, the last step in the process of creating your PCB is drilling all the holes up. In this case, it wasn't too much trouble because I'm using service mount parts. I've had cases where I've had to drill two 300 holes and it's taken the whole evening. This one only took about 10 or 15 minutes and without any trouble. Stay tuned for the next episode where I place all the components on the board, plug in the battery, calibrate it, put it in its box, and then enjoy using it. Ta-ta for now. Riley. Riley. Did I make a mistake? Did I make a mistake? Okay, it's not miscamic, Riley. Did I make a mistake? Riley. You can help me fix it? Well, you can spot that mistake, eh? Ah! Okay, I made a mistake. I'll fix it next time. Oh, don't growl at me, Riley.